little change up from last week, well, the last year. We've been in Revelation, and since this is a celebration of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, I want to bring this issue up. It's uh, an issue that I've been dealing with in the last few Watchmen broadcasts, a uh, very serious issue in my opinion, uh, because Jesus warned us, Paul warned us, God warned us, it's all in the Old Testament, it's all in the New Testament, it's the issue of the real Jesus. Making sure that you have the real Jesus. Let me explain that. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11. If he said, bear with me in my folly. For if any man come preaching another Jesus whom we have not preached. Or, you re or another spirit whom you have not received. Or another gospel. Whom you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. So Paul warned us of three things that he knew the devil would try to introduce into the world and did introduce into the world. Someone presenting themselves as Jesus or someone saying, this is Jesus, but it's not Jesus. So how can we know the difference? Or he said, someone saying, oh, this is the Holy Spirit. But you know from the Bible, it's not the Holy Spirit. Or someone saying, this is the real gospel. But you've read the Bible. You know that it's not the real gospel. So you know, if, you know they're lying. And lots, lots of groups do it. Jesus said in Matthew 24, Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Because, number one, Jesus at that time was standing right in front of them. Number two, when he ascended on high, he went to be at the right hand of the Father and is the one mediator between us and God. Are there more than one mediator between us and God? No. So if someone says, this person here is a mediator between you and God, you say, no. Only Christ can be the mediator between us and God. Okay? So he says that here in Matthew 24. Um, John. John in 1 John and 2 John is the only writer in the Bible who used the word antichrist. Matthew never said it. Luke. Paul never used it. It's in... Have you found that? Have you found the look in the sermons folder, watchman folder, the way for Christ? Got it? Okay. All right. They're having a little problem upstairs. John used the term Antichrist. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists. Already in John's day, John was the last living apostle. He died somewhere around A.D. 95, somewhere in that area. And, he's, and already by then, there were false prophets and false teachers promoting a false Jesus, Antichrist. Um, he says in 2 John 1, 7, For many deceivers are entered into the world. So I want you to think about this. Here's the one true Christ. He has the one true gospel. Is there another way that a person can go to heaven other than by the gospel? Can you climb a ladder? Can you buy your way? Can you pay the church a ton of money and go to heaven that way? Is it a blue light special at Kmart? Does Walmart ever have it in the clearance section? No, there is one way to heaven. And that is by Jesus Christ. Only one way. You might say, well, you're being arrogant because you think you have the only religion. 
Let me say this. I didn't invent any religion. I did not come up with nor invent any religion anywhere, including the one I believe. I read other religions. I chose this one because I believe it's right. Many deceivers are entered into the world. So we have the one Christ who is the one way to God, the one offering, the one sacrifice accepted, and he's gone up now to be at the right hand of the Father to pray for us. Who, there are many deceivers who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an anti-Christ. So anybody who says that the real Jesus, when he came, that his flesh offering on the cross was not sufficient to save mankind. John said it. Paul said it. Jesus said it. They're an antichrist. They are a different, another Jesus. They are what Jesus said. If someone says, here's Christ, you believe it not. So, now, we have communion. What the Bible tells us about the bread, and we do not drink wine, alcohol wine. Because, do you know why? Because it's fermented with leaven. And the rules for Passover was there was to be no leaven found in their house anywhere, not in the bread and certainly not in the wine. The word wine in the Bible could either mean wine like with leaven, alcoholic, or wine was fruit of the vine, vino. So we use grape juice, fruit of the vine, fresh wine, new wine. And according to... What Paul said in 1 Corinthians, the purpose of us when we have communion is not that it saves us, not that it resaves us, not that it, it cleanses us from our sins that we committed since the last time we had communion. When we have communion, Paul said it is that we are showing Christ's death Till he come. So the purpose when we have communion, and we will have here shortly, not today. But the purpose when we have communion, according to the Bible, is that we are displaying to the world that we believe that Christ and only Christ died one time as an offering for our sins. Every time we sin, does Christ have to die all over again for our sins? Gary, no. Because Hebrews plainly says that Christ offered one sacrifice for all mankind forever. And then he sat down at the right hand of the Father. However, it's not just in the Catholic Church, it is in the Lutheran Church, the Episcopal Church, which is the Church of England in America. It is in the Church of England. It is in the United Churches of Christ. It is in most Methodist churches, not all. Um, it is in some Reformed churches. They believe in what's called transubstantiation or consubstantiation. What that means is they believe that when they have their communion, let's say this is their Eucharist, that when it's brought out, it's just a plain piece of unleavened bread. When the priest prays a prayer over it, suddenly and magically it turns into the physical flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, the real body of Christ. And during the mass, 
they say, and I've done my homework on it. It is said that they re-sacrifice Christ again for that sacrifice. Every time a mass is said, they are killing Jesus all over again for your sins, which violates the scripture. Now, so once the priest has said the Eucharistic prayer and he holds up the Eucharist, he says, here is Christ. And everybody has to believe it. But Jesus just got done telling us, if any man says, here is Christ, believe it not. For there shall be many false Christs and many false prophets. That's what he said. So he said, don't believe what they're telling you. Uh, there is an article, you can look this up on... Wikipedia, the, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And it says Catholicism, Eastern Orthodoxy, Oriental Orthodoxy, the church. And I'm not bashing anybody's religion. What I'm doing is if somebody says something about God, like I believe God is the Easter bunny. Then I can't allow that. To be taught like to my kids or to my church or anybody I know. Because I can point to you in the scriptures who exactly who God is. And I can also point to you a bunch of places from Genesis to Revelation where the Bible says nowhere that God is the Easter Bunny. So number one, it never, the Bible never says it. Number two... I can show you a lot of places in the Bible exactly what and who God is. So if, if these churches, Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, Oriental Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Moravian Church, Lutheran Church, Anglican Church, Methodist Church, Reformed Churches, if they all say this really is the very presence of Christ, he literally is right here in my hand, I have to say that is not what the Bible says. That's a lie. That's my job. Uh, let me read some articles from the Catholic Church. The mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharist species is unique. It raises the Eucharist which is the wafer above all sacraments as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end to which all the sacraments tend. In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and the blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, therefore and whole, the whole Christ is truly, really, and substantially contained. The presence is called real, by which is not intended to exclude the other types of presence as if they could not be real too. But because it is presence in the fullest sense, that is to say, it is substantial presence by which Christ, God, and man make himself holy and entirely present. What they're saying is, we, when, we don't just say we symbolize the Eucharist as Christ. They say it is Christ in every way, shape, and form. Um... The church has always understood a real presence. For example, St. Ignatius of Antioch, who was eaten by the beast in Rome around 107 AD, wrote, The Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, St. Justin the Martyr wrote around 145, We have been taught that the food is the flesh and blood of that Jesus who was made flesh. The Council of Trent defined that Jesus is really present in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. Now, they quoted all of these people, St. Ignatius, um, St. Justin the Martyr and the Council of Trent. What did they leave out? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st, 2nd Corinthians. They left the scriptures out. They left the Bible out. Um, the consecrated bread has become Christ's body. The consecrated wine has become Christ's blood. 
Jesus Christ is substantially present in a way that is entirely unique. This happens by the Holy Spirit through the ministry of the priest or bishops acting in the person of Christ. So let me stop right here. Their doctrine is that the priest in his robes is Jesus. On the stage in front of everybody, he is Jesus. So let's, let's deal with that for a minute. Remember when, I can't remember who it was, somebody help me out. They brought to Jesus somebody who was sick. I don't remember if he was the one who was sick of the palsy where he had his right, I think his hand was withered. And they brought him out to Jesus on the Sabbath day to see if they would heal him. He would heal him. And Jesus made his hand whole. And they got mad. So then what did Jesus do after that? He forgave his sins. He said, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now they're really furious. Because they said what? No one can forgive sins except who? God. And were they right on that? Who was Jesus? God. So where... Between Genesis to Malachi, Matthew to Revelation, where does it say anywhere in here that a priest has the right to forgive your sins in place of God? Did you read that anywhere, Cubby? Gary, you went to seminary. Seminary Gary. That's your new name. You didn't read that anywhere, did you? Anybody else read that anywhere in the Bible? That a man, a human man, can stand in the place of God and forgive your sins. Because that's what they're saying here. They're saying this happens by the Holy Spirit through the ministry of the priest or bishop acting in the person of Christ. They're saying he, while he's standing there with his robes on, is Christ in the flesh. Then it says, while he's acting the person of Christ during the Eucharistic prayer, see what happens is they bring the wafer out and everybody knows that it was either made in a factory or baked by nuns in a convent. Sometimes that happens. And everybody is aware that that bread, that unleavened bread, uh, this right here, is nothing more than a mixture of water, salt, and flour. Everybody knows it. Priest knows it. Congregation knows it. Church knows it. Everybody knows it. So they say, when the priest says, be pleased, O God, we pray to bless, acknowledge and approve this offering in any respect, make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved son, our Lord Jesus Christ. That is one of the Eucharistic prayers. There's four of them in among English traditions. There's four of them. That's just one of them. They believe that when that priest says those words, that Instantly, now, that bread has turned into flesh. It's no longer wheat and water. It is the real body of Jesus Christ. So, with the Mass, when we are offered the host, which is the, the bread... And hear the statement, the body of Christ, we answer, Amen. Uh, today I'm coming out with a new video on this, and I, I include a video. They believe it so much during the Catholic Mass, if you've ever watched a Catholic Mass, 
The priest, the altar boy will bring out a tray or another priest will bring out a tray and there will be a pitcher of water. There will be a bowl of the, the communion or a bottle of communion wine, uh, a chalice or a cup and a tray with the Eucharist on it. And the priest will take the bottle of wine. He'll set it here. He'll take the chalice. He'll set it here. He has, he puts a card over it. And then I'm trying to remember, make sure I get this right. At some point, the guy sets the tray down and he takes the pitcher of water and a special towel. And the priest goes over, over a top of another bowl and holds his fingers out. And they pour water over these two fingers right here on each hand. They pour water on those. And then he dries them off on that special towel. Now... According to them, his whole body has been cleansed from all sin, all impurities. And they even say that in case there's any particle of dirt on his fingers, that he has to wash those fingers because he's going to pick up Jesus Christ and hold Jesus Christ in his fingers. And I'm not making this up. If you've you can look this up online. You can read Wikipedia articles. You can find the evidence. I never, in doing this research, I never one time consulted any anti-Catholic source. I went right to the source. The reason why in every mass they wash the priest's fingers is that if he has a particle of dirt on his fingers, he cannot be touching Jesus, who is holy, with his unwashed fingers. That's called a superstition. Remember, remember what they accused the disciples of when they were eating bread and the Pharisees, who were the religious rule keepers, they saw the Jesus' disciples eating bread with unwashed hands. Remember that? And they went laying into Jesus. Aha! We caught your disciples eating bread with unwashed hands. They've gone against our traditions. They never quoted scripture. My mom will tell you that I almost never washed my hands when I ate. Tell them, mom. Almost never did. When I worked in construction... When it came lunchtime, if I was hungry, I ate my sandwich and my crackers and my little Debbie snack cake without washing my hands. But they accused Jesus that and they couldn't quote scripture. All they had was Jewish tradition since the law had come down. The tradition was that no Jew could ever touch a piece of bread or any morsel of food without washing their hands first. And Jesus said, you have made the word of God of none effect by your traditions superstitions Jesus said in Matthew 23 you're the ones who wash the outside of the bowl but you leave the inside unclean and nobody ever eats anything from the outside of the bowl it's the inside that counts when God looks at us according you remember when Samuel went looking at Eli's not Eli's sons, Jesse's sons to find the king. And he's looking at all of them. He picks the tallest one, the best looking one. And God says to him, what? David, you're looking on the outside. I look on the inside. We learned that lesson. Now. Holy communion. This is Catholic doctrine. Hold, offers a strength called grace. To preserve us from mortal sin by deepening our friendship with Christ. The sac this sacrament makes it more difficult for us to break our union with him by mortal sin. I want to move through some of this because I want to get to a, a point here. Hang on here. This is from a book written for Catholics called the Catholic Catechism for Adults. The Mass is a sacrifice in the sense that when it takes place... Jesus Christ, through the bishop or priest celebrating the Mass, makes present sacramentally his saving sacrificial death on the cross by which he redeemed us from our sins. 
This Eucharistic sacrifice is the memorial of Christ's redeeming death. The term memorial in this context is not simply a remembrance of past events. However, let me show you what Jesus actually said. This do in remembrance of me. Remember what Paul said. We do show the Lord's death until he come. Paul, neither Paul nor Jesus nor any of the Bible writers ever said, we do sacrifice Jesus again until he comes. He said, we show that Christ has already died once until he comes. But the catechism says, by the term memorial in this context, it is not simply a remembrance of past events. It is a making present in a sacramental manner the sacrifice of the cross of Christ and his victory. They're re-sacrificing Christ. When the church celebrates the Eucharist, the memorial of our Lord's death and resurrection, this central event of salvation becomes really present and the work of our redemption is carried out. The Eucharistic sacrifice is offered to adore and thank God to pray for all our needs and to gain pardon for our sins. Now, let me ask you a question. According to the Bible, when you ask God for salvation, how many times must you do it? Once. But according to Catholic dogma, it is required for a Catholic to go to Mass at least every Lord's Day, but if not, at least once a year, every year. Catholic churches around the country and around the world, including Kenya, are full today because of this requirement, because they have been told that they can never, ever, ever know that they're actually going to heaven when they die. Because if they have not been to Mass, if they have not been to confession in a long time, and they don't even tell you how long it is, then you must, you cannot go to heaven, you must, bare minimum, go to purgatory for hundreds, if not thousands of years in order to pay off any sins or, or the masses that you didn't go to. You must pay a penalty for that. For one sin, I don't remember which one it was, but in reading this, for one sin, and I think it was non-mass attendance, minimum 300 days in purgatory. For missing mass, one time. Now, here's why I'm saying all this. This is what happened when Christ was crucified. Crucifixion. I mean, they could have chopped his head off. They could have stabbed him immediately with a sword. They could have poisoned him any number of ways to instantly kill him. But the Romans came up with crucifixion to make a point to anybody who would dare speak out against the Roman government. And that is, we're going to hang them on a cross so that it takes all day long and even into the night to suffocate them. Because when you're hanging on your arms like this, you bear the weight on your feet, but your feet get tired, especially if you've got two nails driven into them. It's too painful. So then you slump, and all the weight goes down on your arms. And according to that diagram, it crushes, it pushes your rib cage into your lungs and suffocates you. And it takes hours to do that. It's more humane to put a rope around somebody's neck and let them drop and snap their neck instantly. Instantly, Our Savior was strangled to death from the ninth hour 
what was it? The sixth hour? They had to get him down before dark. So they were going to break his legs. They broke the other two guys' legs. But when they got to Jesus, he had already said, it is finished. And they gave up the ghost. So he was already dead. And that's when they put the spear through his side and the blood and water issued forth. But for hours, all day long, he suffocated to death. And I want you to bear this in mind when I preach the message this morning. How easy is it to talk while you're suffocating? While you're being strangled? And here's why I'm saying this. Turn to Acts chapter 15. By the way, this is a picture of a typical mass. And it's actually written in the catechism that no mass can be said unless there is present a crucifix on the stage. They cannot have a mass without a crucifix. And there's a reason why I'm telling you all this. So, here they are offering um, hoc est. How does it go? Hoc est corpus meum this is my body in front of an idol in i mean here's pope benedict in front of the they're at the church where the shroud of turin is they're in front of that idol here's pope francis in front of mary here are three priests offering the eucharist there's a crucifix in the back the church celebrates liturgy using an abundance of signs, symbols, and rituals. We do this in a holy environment in which architecture, sculpture, sculpture is an idol. Now, Acts 15. The Jerusalem Council met in, in the book of Acts to decide, number one, when the Holy Spirit poured out, everybody that was in Jerusalem, not nine, 99 times out of 100, they were Jews because they were there because of the Feast of Pentecost. They were required by the law to be there. So in the early years, from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 10, it really wasn't anybody but Jews getting saved. In Acts chapter 10, Peter preached to the first fully Gentile, which is us, whether we're Anglo, whether we're African, whether we are from the Philippines or whether we're from Taiwan or we're from Asia or we're from anywhere else in the world other than Jerusalem. So uh, Peter is at Cornelius' house, who is a Gentile, and he preaches the gospel and he believes and his family believes and the Holy Ghost comes down on all of them and they start speaking the languages that they spoke in Acts chapter 2. And Peter's going, looks to me like Gentiles get saved. So by Acts chapter 15, now you got a bunch of Jews saying, ah, 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 they have to be circumcised like us Jews, and they have to follow the Jewish customs, they have to follow the Jewish uh, feast days, they have to follow the Jewish law in order to be saved. So one spoke, one spoke, one spoke. There was no Pope at this meeting. Peter was there. But Peter didn't make the decision. The Holy Ghost made the decision. You read Acts 15. The Holy Ghost made the decision upon... Let me tell you who was there. In Acts 15, I guess I'll turn there. I'm trying to get this done before the bell rings because this is important. This is very important. Acts chapter 15 verse... I think it's verse 3... No, four. When they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church. The church was there. Church people there. Y'all y'all were there. Um, and the apostles were there. And the elders, that means the elder men of the churches, the presbytery. And these were just aged men in the church who had wisdom, but they were saved. All of them were there. Not Nobody was Pope. Nobody was going to say, I'm... I'm in charge. I say it's this way. The Holy Ghost put it in all their hearts and they all agreed. And they said, can the, can the Gentiles be saved without keeping the law? James stood up and said, well, of course. We're Jews. We never kept the law. So why should we require them to keep the law? So here's, here's they said, however, we think there's four important rules that they need to keep because 
the, most of these Gentiles came from pagan temples where they were worshiping idols and they were eating things sacrificed to gods. So let's, according to the Old Testament, you can find every one of these in the Old Testament law. Here's our sentence. Acts chapter 15, verse 19. Wherefore my sentence is that we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God, but that we write unto them, number one, that they abstain from pollutions of what? What's that word? Idols. Number two, from fornication, which means any, any sexual act outside of the bonds of the marriage between a man and a woman. Any of it. Number three, from things strangled. How did Jesus die? He was strangled. Four, from blood. So that's what they said. When they went to write it down in verse 28 and 29, here's how they wrote it down. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. That number one, you abstain from meats. That, and meat is anything you eat. In, in Bible terms, meats can be grain goods or flesh goods. Meats offered to idols. What did we just say was the number one rule about holding a mass? It had to be in the presence of a, what am I, do I just say it for me? A crucifix. Not a cross. A cross with an idol on it. That's, a cru that's the difference. It had to be offered in the presence of a statue, an idol. In fact, I found out that in practically every Catholic church on the stage is Joseph, Mary, Jesus in the middle. I, I, I didn't hear the bell ring. I didn't hear the bell. Did anybody hear the bell ring? I didn't hear the bell ring. And that clock must be wrong, because I still have 10 minutes, according to that. Anyway, that you abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood. You cannot drink blood, and that's what they say it turns into, blood. From things strangled, which is Christ, and from fornication. So abstain from meats offered to idols, from blood, from anything that has been strangled, and from fornication. And the Catholic Mass... The Lutheran Mass, the Anglican Church Mass, the Church of Russia Mass, the Reformed Mass, all of them violate three of those four rules in holding to their doctrine of transubstantiation. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We thank you for it. Father, we pray, dear God, that your word would go forth. Father, I've not said anything in hate. I didn't write our religion. I didn't write other people's religions. I followed your word and I know what it says and I know what we're supposed to do and what we're not supposed to do. And Father, everybody in this room, including me, have sinned and come short of your glory. So just because I haven't eaten the Eucharist doesn't mean that I haven't done anything far worse than that. Because I have. So I pray, Father, Lord, that you would have mercy on us and draw us to your truth in your word, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.